kami bangga dan bahagia menerima kehadiran Anda sekalian. Acara ini adalah bagian pertama dari rangkaian kuliah daring yang diselenggarakan oleh Lembaga Sejarah Arsitektur Indonesia dan Universitas Katolik Parahyangan. Acara ini juga akan direkam dan live streaming melalui channel YouTube Penjelajahan Menuju Arsitektur Indonesia. Rangkaian acara pada malam hari ini akan diawali dengan sambutan oleh Bapak Dr. Alwin Suryono selaku Ketua Pusat Studi Arsitektur Universitas Katolik Parayangan dan Bapak Suprisno Murtioso selaku Ketua Lembaga Sejarah Arsitektur Indonesia. Kemudian dilanjutkan dengan sajian dari pembicara utama yaitu Bapak Robert Cohort dengan judul Decolonizing Building Cultures in the Anthropocene. Sesudahnya ditanggapi oleh Ibu Indah Widya Stuti dan terakhir tanya-jawab yang akan dipandu oleh Bapak Gunawan Cahyono. Pertanyaan dapat disampaikan menggunakan fasilitas chat Zoom, dan bagi yang mengikuti melalui YouTube Live, dapat menggunakan fasilitas live chat YouTube. Pertanyaan mohon dilengkapi dengan nama. Kuliah pada malam hari ini akan diberikan dalam bahasa Inggris, namun pertanyaan dapat disampaikan dalam bahasa Indonesia. Bagi peserta yang membutuhkan sertifikat, dapat mengisi Google Form yang tertera pada Zoom chat ini. Terima kasih. Uh, demikian, langsung saja kami mengundang Bapak Dr. Alwin Suryono selaku Ketua Pusat Studi Arsitektur Universitas Katolik Parahyangan dan Bapak Sutrisno Murtioso selaku Ketua Lembaga Sejarah Arsitektur Indonesia. Jadi silakan. Selamat sore. Yang saya hormati for Profesor Robert Kohor, pembicara pada hari pertama ini, yang saya hormati Profesor Gunawan Cayono, yang bersedia menjadi pemandu acara ini, yang saya hormati Dr. Indah Widya Suti sebagai penyangga acara ini, yang saya hormati teman-teman panitia dari Lembaga Sejarah Arsitektur Indonesia, yang saya hormati teman-teman dan adik-adik panitia dari Arsitektur Unpar, yang saya hormati hadirin bapak-bapak ibu sekalian dari berbagai penjuru tanah air, Idealnya, kita berseminar di dalam ruang yang cukup representatif untuk bersama mencermati sejarah Indonesia yang kita cintai. Namun, semua yang sudah lama direncanakan ini harus disesuaikan dengan situasi prihatin yang cukup panjang. Walau demikian, semua ini tidak boleh mengurangi rasa syukur kita pada kebersamaan melakukan penjelajahan menuju arsitektur Indonesia. Baiknya kita sambut hangat semua dari para pemuka agama dan tokoh-tokoh budaya agar menjadikan momentum musibah pandemi ini sebagai sebuah kebangkitan baru untuk melakukan pemantapan arsitektur Indonesia. Seminar penjelajahan menuju arsitektur Indonesia ini sejalan dengan visi UNPAR, yaitu mengembangkan potensi lokal hingga ketataran global demi peningkatan martabat manusia. Inilah saatnya kita membenahi diri secara arif terhadap nilai, pandangan, dan sikap di bidang arsitektur. Selamat berseminar. Semoga seminar ini dapat bermanfaat bagi kita semua dan juga bagi bangsa Indonesia. Terima kasih. Salam. Om Santi 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 Om. Nama budaya. Salam kebajikan. Terima kasih. Selamat malam atas kehadiran rekan-rekan semua. Thank you and welcome to all of you. Particularly, we are honored by uh, Professor Gordon Dominic, who is uh, already here just for this event. Thank you very much. And then, and I'll use Bahasa Indonesia afterwards after this. Um, di luar dugaan, peminat yang tadinya diperhitungkan hanya 100 orang, ternyata yang mendaftar hampir mencapai 500 orang. Jadi mohon maaf kalau ada beberapa kesulitan, terutama tadi kami mendapat kesulitan pada mail server kami, sehingga mungkin ada beberapa yang terluput dari daftar pengiriman. Tetapi jika itu yang terjadi, mungkin 
bisa diberitahukan bahwa mereka yang tidak hadir hari ini bisa mengikuti acara ini di channel YouTube. Um, rangkaian kuliah ini diadakan sebenarnya untuk memperingati ulang tahun ke-31 Lembaga Sejarah Arsitektur Indonesia dan kesempatan ini kayaknya adalah anggap adalah waktu yang tepat untuk mempersembahkan sumbangan bagi arsitektur Indonesia yang kita cintai ini khususnya dari sudut pandang sejarawan. Juga pada kesempatan pertama ini kami menganggap perlu untuk memperoleh pandangan dari luar Indonesia karena biasanya tetangga yang baik akan punya gambaran yang lebih e, menyeluruh dan objektif tentang rumah kita. Jadi kami berharap para tetangga-tetangga yang baik hati itu bisa menyampaikan pandangannya kepada kita semua. Saya rasa itu saja. Semoga rangkaian kuliah daring Lembaga Sejarah Arsitektur Indonesia ini bisa memperkaya kasanah wacana arsitektur Indonesia. Sekali lagi, terima kasih dan silakan menikmati acara ini. Silakan. Terima kasih Bapak Dr. Alwin Suyono dan Bapak Strisno Murtioso. Berikutnya kami mempersilahkan Bapak Gunawan Cahyono. Silakan, Pak. Selamat malam semua rekan-rekan saya. Saya Gunawan Cahyono. Saya mendapat kehormatan untuk membawa menelaras acara ini. Nah, yang akan Anda dengar nanti ada dua pembicara, sebetulnya bukan pembicara, pemberi kuliah ya. Yang pertama adalah Robert Cowherd. Beliau adalah seorang profesor yang sekarang menjabat di Wentworth Institute of Technology. Saya kira saya nggak akan berpanjang-panjang karena sekarang sudah era ya, internet, Anda bisa cari, tahu tentang dia. Tapi yang paling penting saya perkenalkan, beliau adalah pencinta nasi liwet. Dan beliau sangat mencintai Indonesia juga. Bisa dilihat dari nanti sosoknya yang memakai batik hari ini. Yang kedua adalah Indah Widya Stuti. Seorang dokter yang sekarang men, uh, dosen di Institut Teknologi Bandung. Dan saya kira juga Anda bisa mencari tahu tentang beliau lebih jauh dari internet. Banyak sekali karya mereka, eh, beliau, kalau nggak salah, beliau ini langsung pindah. Tadi ada acara ya, Pak Bu Indah. Jadi ini sangat beruntung dalam era yang bisa memasuk ke namanya online ini, kita bertemu dengan dua tokoh ini. Dan saya sekarang persembahkan Robert Cowherd, beliau akan menyajikan dalam bahasa Inggris, tetapi beliau itu sangat menguasai bahasa Indonesia. Cuman kalau sekarang sudah cukup lama meninggalkan Indonesia, lalu lebih baik dia sampaikan dalam bahasa Inggris, tapi nanti nanti Anda bisa menyampaikan pertanyaan dalam bahasa Indonesia ke beliau. Uh, silakan, Bob. Anda, ini sekarang waktunya Anda dulu. Habis itu nanti Ibu Indah. Joseph Kujitomo, Iwan Sudradat, uh, uh, Inda Indrawati, dan, um, dan lain-lain. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to make this presentation uh, of many new ideas that are just coming up in my research. Um, so uh, I ask forgiveness for uh, giving the presentation in English. 
And uh, if you hear some sounds in the background, that's just trying to keep me on time as uh, there's a lot to present. Um, so the topic uh, that I've chosen grows out of my recent research on the Anthropocene uh, and bamboo uh, and uh, my parallel passion for decolonizing education, decolonizing uh, the culture of architecture. And so these themes come together. I'm trying to weave these themes together in this lecture. So um, let's see if I can get everything to work. The key question uh, at the core that is driving this research is that given the challenges of the Anthropocene, uh, given the challenges of global multiple over, overlapping global crises in the 21st century, what alternatives to the global nation state extractive capitalism offer more favorable outcomes? Uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different outcome is what uh, Albert Einstein told us. So I've, uh, I will attempt uh, to cover some of this, these thoughts and this evidence in five sections. Uh, the first section is um, a, a look at an, a very rich example of a complex adaptive system. We are told that uh, with global climate change and so many challenges that what we need to respond are, are an alternative to these rigid uh, systems of modernity uh, of the welfare state, what we need is a more agile response, perhaps uh, powered in part by uh, the power of computation and the information age. So uh, that's a core question as we look at the SUBAC. It was hoped that techniques developed in. So uh, in the 1980s, uh, Green Revolution uh, rice uh, production was scientifically transformed by creating new strains of rice, new fertilizers, new techniques. And throughout the world, uh, these techniques were brought to different uh, agricultural uh, geographies and uh, geologies uh, to see if uh, poverty alleviation and uh, food production uh, could be advanced. Uh, the surprise in Bali, it worked, it worked in many places, but the surprise outcome in Bali was after a few years of apparent success, uh, things started to suddenly deteriorate. There were record-breaking uh, insect infestations, soil fertility dropped, and uh, water scarcity caused great plant stress. And uh, it was quickly abandoned uh, in the mid 1980s. And they went back to uh, the traditional systems in which uh, the Hindu Balinese religion uh, uh, was a central part of the common resource management strategies of, um, of, of rice cultivation. Uh, in one of the most densely populated uh, locations in the world, it turned out that the Suba uh, irrigation system was uh, a very finely tuned, sophisticated, complex management strategy that had been uh, hidden in the shadows. Um, uh, Stephen Lansing's very famous work uh, studying uh, the Subak system uh, he, uh, in the 1980s and 90s. He was there in Bali when this all happened. And he partnered with uh, a computer scientist to try to create a sophisticated computer model to replicate the system behavior of the Subak and try to figure out why it did such a great job at outperforming the computer and the technocratic, scientifically uh, based uh, green revolution systems. And what came out of that research is uh, a profound 
uh, appreciation for how this religious, uh, social, geological, syst agricultural system uh, was able to respond in real time without being directed by some uh, all-seeing technocrat making decisions. Instead, it was a self-regulating system. And uh, this uh, characteristic of system behavior is something that I will refer to in the final portion of this presentation as reflexive system behavior. It is reflexive in that it is self-regulating, somewhat automatic. Once you design the system, the system self-regulates automatically and it regulates, it acts on itself to constantly upgrade and revise the system itself. Um, and this apparently is something that computers do not do well. And uh, Stephen Lansing has followed up this research with a recent book uh, from 2019 called Islands of Order, where he is doing something very similar to what I am doing in this talk, uh, which is attempting to uh, understand uh, the complexity of systems that existed long before the computer and systems that actually outperform even the most sophisticated computer models that we can come up with today. So the second part, um, I'm not sure if Sambatan is a familiar term, but I know that Gotong Royong is a familiar term. Um, Sambatan, uh, I'm looking over at my gallery view and looking for indications from those few of you who have video on. Is Sambatan a, uh, a familiar term out there? Um, well, Sambatan, so we'll look at this. Um, so uh, when the Europeans arrived, and it's important to recognize it wasn't just the Dutch, but it was also the Portuguese, the Spanish, uh, the Dutch, uh, the French, the British, uh, all uh, would, no matter who dominated at any given time, there was a common mission, and I use that word uh, deliberately, a mission to uh, elevate the morality of the populations of Southeast Asia, but also uh, to impose uh, a sense of modern progress, health and hygiene. And those twin concerns resulted in uh, first uh, coercion to uh, outlaw longhouses because it was uh, immoral for multiple families to sleep under one roof, um, but also uh, to outlaw uh, bamboo and thatch and other organic materials that uh, were felt to uh, be a problem when it comes to uh, rat infestation and disease. Uh, when Berlacher uh, visited uh, Indonesia in 1931, he sketched scenes like this uh, out of a romantic sense that these were the last days of any sign of anything uh, that existed before the emergence of modern industrial culture. And so one of the unintended consequences of banning these organic materials uh, was uh, for all intents and purposes, a, a displacement of the Sambatan gift economy system that was simultaneously a system for producing villages, the physical village. Uh, if someone needed a house, the village would get together and build the house. Every family in the village, every household unit would go into the surrounding forest harvest the materials necessary, craft those materials into different uh, uh, elements of the house, and uh, then put it in place in uh, a building day or building uh, week in which the family receiving the house would feed everyone. And so this was 
uh, it was very similar to what we in uh, North America and Europe understand uh, as the building societies that were prominent in, uh, in England um, several centuries ago. Uh, but it, the key thing is uh, everyone grew up knowing how to harvest these materials and how to make these elements. Uh, now, what happened is that uh, with the banning of thatch and bamboo, it forced uh, people to shift to building production that required special skills. It required bringing uh, lumber uh, from far distances. And the main thing that it required was cash. It required an exchange uh, medium uh, that really had profound unintended consequences for these social uh, institutions uh, of constant renewal of the connections between people, uh, the constant renewal of the status and the sense of belonging and the place within the village social structure. And so uh, to this, we, um, we move on to uh, ethnoarchaeology and the availability of understandings that may uh, be thought to have been erased, displaced, or um, otherwise uh, just extinct. So an interesting thing happened back uh, in the 80s uh, when uh, the Green Revolution collapse happened in Bali. Around that same time, there were teams of archaeologists working in Thailand and in Cambodia, and they were excavating canal systems for the first time around uh, their sites and speculating about the possibility that the religious temple uh, structure, the hierarchy and the rituals might have some connection to managing uh, scarce common resources uh, and keeping social uh, harmony between uh, what would otherwise be competing actors struggling to get uh, more water than the other, uh, as we would expect in an extractive capitalism situation. And so uh, when these archaeologists heard what was happening in Bali, uh, they suddenly had access to uh, a living culture, a population of uh, priests and uh, village officials who were actually uh, enacting these rituals of water management through the Hindu Balani system. And so they, they went to Bali and they discovered um, that uh, they had a model, they could study this model and, and use that as a thought experiment, not to assume that it was the same everywhere, but to test out their theories. They would at least have some thought experiments that they could run. Uh, and it turns out that uh, in 2002, uh, there was a sudden awareness of societies on the margins. Um, the, the book by uh, James C. Scott, Seeing Like a State, uh, was followed up by this book, um, The Art of Not Being Governed in which he looks at mainland Southeast Asia as a, a place where um, hundreds, if not thousands of distinct groups uh, are not simply left over untransformed un, uh, by modernity, but who deliberately escaped the lowland rice cultures of the Han Chinese and others in order to uh, find uh, refuge in the highland hills. And if we look at the uh, island archipelago of Southeast Asia, you see a similar thing with this rich diversity of cultures that might actually uh, have uh, some of these complex adaptive systems still at work. Um, and um, I, I think I should acknowledge that several of you in the audience uh, have contributed to these, uh, these materials, um, Professor Domenig, uh, Gunawan, um, and others. Uh, a lot of what I'm showing here comes out of uh, the Archipelago Press um, uh, Indonesian uh, uh, Encyclopedia of Culture. 
Um, and we see uh, a lot of uh, these materials have implications for form. Um, but given um, my time, I'm going to um, breeze over some of these. Um, but you see that in some of these cultures that are still uh, have these building cultures intact, that there's a richness of form uh, that comes out of the use of these materials. Um, there's a parallel uh, body of research about um, Henri McLean Pont's uh, struggle with uh, the, an understanding of some of these deflected forms, his lifelong struggle um, that was triggered in part by uh, his design for uh, the uh, Bandung Institute of Technology. Um, and so we move on to the fourth uh, topic, which now is the Anthropocene. And I'm not sure how common this term is right now. Uh, my colleagues still struggle uh, with even how to pronounce it. Um, there's the British Anthropocene, and then there's the um, more North American pronunciation Anthropocene. Um, take your pick. And, uh, but the important thing is what does it mean? And so, um, and what is driving the Anthropocene? Basically Anthropocene is the epic of human uh, impact on the planet where the largest force, the most determinative force of global transformation is the human species, thus the Anthropo. And the hardest thing about this is what is driving the Anthropocene? Uh, we, this is challenging in that we take for granted that human progress marches on uh, as a natural instinct uh, to uh, move into a better world. And so the forces that are driving this specific kind of progress that is characteristic of the forces of the Anthropocene uh, are actually very, very special forces. Um, in 1993, when I was living in Solo, um, working at the Kraton, Surakarta, I went for a long bicycle ride uh, on my Cepeda Curbao uh, out to Solo Baru just to see what was happening out there. And I found a very eerie landscape of fully finished houses that were quite empty and uh, wandering around uh, in this setting, I asked someone I met, um, uh, when are people gonna move in? And uh, he patiently explained to me that these properties uh, were investments that the family he worked for uh, bought, had two children, so they bought two houses. And upon uh, when it was, came time for them to get married and uh, their children to get married, they would sell the house and use the proceeds to finance the wedding and establish that family. They would not move into the house, they would sell the house. So property uh, was being uh, used not for use, the use of people, but as an investment. And uh, that led to my 2000 dissertation research at MIT, where I looked at um, the cultural construction of Jakarta in the late Suharto uh, period, New Order period, and looked at how the invention of a real estate market released vast fortunes of speculative capital. Uh, and it was driven by the banking system that was looking for a way to diversify and to accumulate wealth uh, beyond what was possible before a land market existed. And um, it, so many of these buildings uh, were built, sold, but not occupied uh, throughout uh, the 90s and up to the crash. And I wrote a piece in 2002 with my co-author co at USC, Eric Heikela, um, speculating that Southern California real estate practices were what was driving the aesthetic and design uh, forces and um, very shortly after that, I don't know if they read our piece or not, but um, sure enough, Orange County, uh, Java uh, became a reality. Um, 
And an understanding of the role of land markets is essential uh, to understanding the uh, miraculous transformation of China in the subsequent decades, that the development of China is driven not just on their manufacturing systems uh, and their low cost labor, but also on a similar process of taking land that really only had use value. The price of the land was based on its agricultural productivity or its value as a place to live. Uh, but then uh, they discovered the magic of real estate markets and speculation and the exchange value, as Marx would have it, of the land and um, released that vast fortune uh, in what was, uh, for all intents and purposes, a deliberate uh, real estate bubble. Uh, and as long as the bubble doesn't burst, we're doing great. Um, and some of this resulted in what has famously been documented as the ghost cities of China, that the land gets developed, the land gets uh, built, but it does not get occupied. Uh, it is a, um, a situation in which if a hectare of land is worth $1 uh, as agricultural land, it suddenly becomes worth $100 per hectare and then $1,000 and then $10,000. And these vast fortunes uh, are released, not uh, really through speculative sales. Um, and this phenomenon has really stretched across the planet. Um, London has been famously uh, studied uh, and the, the term necrotecture, necro meaning dead, dead architecture. Um, these luxury buildings are built, uh, they are sold, and the lights in the upper floors uh, remain dark at night because no one lives there. Um, the London research, they looked at utility bills and uh, found uh, which units were being occupied and which units were not being occupied. They could tell by the electricity meter. And in New York City, the New York Times did this study of how shell companies are being used to purchase real estate without disclosing the name of the people who are actually purchasing these units. It is believed that a lot of this is money laundering from drug trafficking or um, even uh, uh, the Revolutionary uh, Guard in Iran. Uh, other uh, nefarious organizations use real estate um, as a way to hold their capital in a secure, diverse uh, set of holdings. Which brings us to Dubai. Uh, and this is another thing that is driving the Anthropocene, driving uh, planetary transformation by human activity. Uh, uh, Dubai is in a desert. Uh, it is not uh, an attractive place to live. The land is not worth a lot. Um, but yet uh, each of these towers is about as tall as the tallest three buildings in Boston, uh, where land is valuable, where people do commute in, or at least used to in the before times. Um, and uh, each of these towers represents a separate distinct investment. And this the height of the tower is proportional to the amount of money that any single investor is interested in parking in real estate. And so uh, there are 60 to 80 story chunks of money that need to be uh, converted into real estate. Uh, and then what happened uh, famously is that the sovereign wealth fund of one of the Emirates uh, was much larger than could be held in a 60 to 80 story building. And so uh, we have the Burj Khalifa. It is not the tallest building in the world because uh, of market demand for whatever uh, is supposed to happen in this building. It's not the tallest building in the world just to be the tallest building in the world. It is the tallest building in the world because that is the size of the sovereign wealth fund that it needed to house. And um, this brings us to this overarching uber point that 
uh, there is this relationship between architectural projects, the systems that that architectural project uh, is the instrument of, and the larger culture that either drives the system or that results from the system itself. So uh, this is a set of reflexive relationships. Uh, it's like the chicken and the egg, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, the system or the culture or the architectural project? Um, so this is both a diagram of how huge the forces are that are involved in every architectural project and the futility of thinking that architecture could have any impact on these larger things. But at the same time, it is also very optimistic that given the fact that an architectural project is the instrumentation of a system, that an architectural project conceived and produced within this consciousness is capable of driving systematic change. And that is another lecture um, that I give about Medellin, Colombia, where exactly that, what strategy was employed. Um, but we don't have time for that. In the meantime, uh, we are looking at the instrumental operation of this architecture. In order to protect the investment value of the real estate of Dubai, the government has forbidden anyone from disclosing the vacancy rate of these buildings. When asked, what is the vacancy rate? the person responding is legally obligated to say what the ownership rate is. And the ownership rate, because it's an investment, is quite high, much higher than the actual uh, occupancy rate. Uh, and so um, uh, we have these ritual renewals of confidence in the real estate value. This is a famous building. The, uh, this ritual renewal every new year of uh, the building uh, through fireworks as a platform for fireworks is a way to ensure the investment community that this building uh, promises uh, dependably to be as valuable or more valuable 10 years from now as it is now. The primary purpose of this building is to retain its value. That is the purpose of this architecture. This is uh, what is driving to a large extent uh, the Anthropocene. Uh, it is not just uh, the familiar extraction, the, uh, in, the imperative to extract wealth that we saw throughout the period of colonialism that is very familiar to us in the study of colonialism uh, in Southeast Asia, um, now it is beyond extraction. It is also the promise of uh, financial return. So this is the financialization of extraction um, on top of it. So this is a very uh, powerful visualization of uh, the, the, the story of the Anthropocene. It's a video I recommend uh, the sound, uh, listening to it with the sound. It starts around the time of the uh, Industrial Revolution when the human population reached about 1 billion people. Uh, it took another 120 years for the human population to reach 2 billion. Uh, and then around uh, 1950, two things happened. Uh, the rate of population growth suddenly accelerated dramatically in, in an unprecedented rate. We were adding a billion people to the human population every 30 years, then every 20 years, and now every 15 years or so. Uh, heading quickly from 1 billion around the time of the Industrial Revolution to the expected peak of around uh, between 10 and 12 billion uh, people on the planet. But wait, uh, there's more. It turns out that the impact on the planet is uh, not just the number of consumers, but you have to multiply that by the average per capita rate of consumption. And as fast as the human population has been accelerating, the rate of consumption has been accelerating even more greatly. 
Uh, and so we have this very rich capacity to model the planet just in time to witness and take the measure of the full uh, impacts that uh, are being uh, wrought on the planet by human activity coordinated by this global uh, consensus of uh, wealth extraction and financial speculation. Again, the wealth extraction uh, is the thing that's actually despoiling the planet through mining and dumping. But there's a multiplier effect, uh, an economic multiplier, which is the speculation. So if the global economy is in the realm of $53 trillion a year, the financial speculation economy might be 150 trillion or 200 trillion. It's difficult to estimate. And so we talked about population. This is what it looks like if you step back and look at the human population um, since the dawn of the agricultural revolution. Uh, in the blink of an eye during many of our lifetimes, uh, it has gone from something that the planet could sustain in terms of numbers and per capita consumption to something that we now need to design for. The design condition of uh, architecture in the 21st century should be, uh, we simply um, round off to 10 billion. Uh, and now it's the role of architects thinking in terms of systems, how do we manage the resources through the instrumentation of architecture to reduce the per capita consumption so that the planet can sustain 10 billion people. No problem, right? Um, Buckminster Fuller famously started this process in the 1980s with his world game. And since then, architects uh, have been using computers to do something very similar. I'm not sure if Vinnie Moss is aware of Buckminster Fuller, I suspect he is. But he's been working with his colleagues to develop computer modeling uh, that tests out extreme scenarios. What if, what would happen if uh, we only invest in defending coastlines? And let's test the outcome by global population redistribution, or let's test the outcome in terms of um, uh, develop, um, uh, economic measures like GDP. Uh, and about and the big one is how much carbon gets released in the atmosphere. That's the one everybody has their, their eyes on. And so you can run these models over and over and test out different scenarios. But the question is, as we look at these new computer models that come out of the methods of architectural speculation, uh, the question is, um, are these computer models that are showing us uh, the different possible outcomes of this bold experiment in planetary management, are these computer models capable of uh, enough sophistication to balance the hundreds of different parameters uh, that is not the purview of any government? There is no global government managing uh, five-year plans for humanity. Um, so is there a sophistication that we can develop using computers that would allow us to manage these common resource pools? Um, and uh, no matter how many times we model things and compare these models, it's not clear that we are gonna do any better than the Green Revolution uh, did uh, during uh, their experiments in Bali in the 1980s. So it's quite sobering. Uh, as great as computers are, um, thank you computer for allowing us to connect on Zoom today. Um, but I'm still sticking with my paper and pencil when it comes to architecture as much as possible. I'm still waiting for the moment when I can draw on my screen and develop a three-dimensional model. So I'm a little skeptical of how quickly computers are catching up. Which brings us to the fifth and final uh, in the last few minutes uh, I have here uh, to quickly run through some interesting things that uh, about 60 years after the Dutch 
architects were going through the villages of uh, Indonesia uh, and learning about uh, bamboo preservation methods, it, the secrets of salt soaking gets lost uh, in, the, in the craziness of modern development of the, of the 20th century, only to be rediscovered, quote unquote, uh, when Irish designer Linda Garland teamed up with a series of German and Dutch scientists to uh, uh, develop these techniques as if for the first time, and then uh, uh, not just create beautiful um, repurposing of uh, pre-colonial forms uh, for luxury estates, people like Richard Branson and David Bowie, she is their designer of bamboo uh, architecture, but she also publishes this uh, comic book teaching anyone who wants to, uh, translates it to multiple languages, anyone who wants to learn how to preserve bamboo uh, can do so. Uh, so there's these two fronts, the luxury uh, market of bamboo uh, aesthetic uh, housing in luxury estates and empowerment of people to do this for themselves. Uh, the Green School um, in Bali um, uses uh, the, the, the amazing capacity of bamboo. And uh, then John Hardy, John and Cynthia Hardy um, do the, the Green School. And John Hardy's daughter, Alora Hardy, you can tell from this sketch, she has a background in fashion design, not architecture which is in part responsible for her being liberated from the computer tyranny of architecture, education, and culture to sketch, model, mock up things at full scale, and then build it um, using the model as the template. Uh, and so skipping the whole part about computers and drawings and all of that. And uh, just in case there's any doubt, um, Alora Hardy and Ibuku are targeting the luxury side of the, of the bamboo market globally, not just the wealthiest 1%, but really the wealthiest 100, you know, one hundredth of a percent. Um, uh, and so what about everybody else? Well, fortunately, there are other architects who are working with bamboo who are able to balance this development, these two branches of the bamboo revolution. One is a decidedly luxury market. The other is targeting uh, the, uh, the challenge of empowering people to grow their own houses using Simon Velez's of Colombia, using his the title of his book. Uh, and of course, um, our own Eko Prawoto and his work Similarly, he is producing some of the most gorgeous bamboo uh, architecture anyone has ever seen while simultaneously empowering people to build their own structures quickly, build it themselves uh, as a way to reverse the deliberate, uh, the wasn't so deliberate, but the impoverishment of uh, the majority of people by removing access to the ability to build their own houses, to participate in a social sambatan culture uh, that uh, preserves both the physical and non-physical capacity of, of large populations to build for themselves. And then the final uh, branch, the final bit of evidence of this branch is Linda Garland's son, Arif Rabik, who has uh, kind of left behind the, uh, the aesthetic aspects of bamboo, um, or at least he doesn't emphasize that. He emphasizes the potential for bamboo to uh, sequester uh, 1 billion of the 40 billion tons of carbon we put into the atmosphere each year. This is a very ambitious young man who uh, is very credibly taking uh, on the task of uh, not just sequestering carbon, but also empowering villages by giving them access to an uh, income stream 
uh, being drawn out of their uh, forests um, in a very interesting uh, provocative uh, proposal to first uh, produce a, a thousand bamboo villages in Indonesia, then replicate it in nine other countries around the tropical world. And so this is really uh, ex an example, exemplary of the challenges that face us moving forward. Uh, this is not just about the aesthetics of architecture, but architecture as the instrumentization of systems and cultures then should not just be on the receiving end of that uh, reflexive relationship, but also could, should we should embrace our capacity as designers to create systems out of our architectural proposals that have transformative impacts by opening up new possibilities that people would otherwise not see. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, exactly. Uh, 40 minutes. Thank you very much.